Welcome to our seventh edition of Vernon First Baptist Church Online. Um, this is actually our eighth week of being a part. Um, let's face it, when we get back together, you are going to miss being able to fast forward past me and get right to, Aunt, or to Pastor Jerry's message or to pause him and go get your coffee refilled. But uh, we do want to welcome you and, and praise God that, that he's put a, a pause button on our world right now and we can actually go out and, and, and look at any worship service, almost any denomination we want. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a great time for Christians to be able to share the gospel of Jesus Christ in ways that we've never been able to do before. Um, I would like to make an announcement regarding our church business meeting, which would normally be this coming Wednesday. Um, due to the COVID restrictions, we are not going to be able to have that here in the church, but we are going to try to do an online Zoom meeting for anyone that wants to participate or can participate. At that Zoom meeting, we will um, make some motions and then we will put it out on the one call system and allow you to, uh, there's, there's a polling option on the one call system where you can vote yes or no. So once the motions are made, you can vote yes or no on those motions. And then uh, the following week, we'll, um, we can tell you the results of those. So uh, the information will be in, in your church newsletter, which I hope will be in your hands uh, by, uh, by this time next week for sure. Um, uh, I want to announce this morning the, the birthdays and anniversaries. Um, I think I missed last week, I think I missed uh, Kathy Price's birthday, which is Saturday, May the 2nd. But coming up on Saturday, May the 9th, uh, Allie Wright is going to uh, celebrate her fifth birthday, and Britt Lilly is also ce celebrating his birthday. So if you'll turn with me in your, in your Bibles to Psalm Chapter 103, verses 1 through 4. Praise the Lord, O my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. And now let's join together in him in the hymn All Hail the Power of Jesus Name. Bow with me in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning with grateful hearts, grateful that we can be a part of a church body 
that reaches out beyond the church walls. Grateful that you have protected us through so much and that you will get us through this as well. Father, we look forward to the time when we can be back together in our churches and celebrating together, but we also thank you for the opportunity you've given us to reach out into the world um, through, through this crisis. Guide us and direct us in all that we do, that your name may be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now if you'll turn with me in your Bibles to the second chapter of Mark, verses 1 through 12. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. So many gathered that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralytic, carried by four of them. Since they could not get to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus, and after digging through it, lowered the mat the paralyzed man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts, and he said to them, Why are you thinking of these things? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, Get up? and take your mat and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of all of them. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. May God add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. And now Pastor uh, Jerry is going to play us a special music on the piano, It Is Well With My Soul.
I have been told that a coincidence is something that happens when God chooses to remain anonymous. I didn't come up with that, but I think it's a, a neat insight. And miracles are a lot like that. They seem to uh, fall into a category that's uh, always interesting, and you always uh, kind of wonder where, where God's hand is in all of that. Miracles come in different shapes and different sizes and uh, at different times. They're basically unpredictable. Uh, sometimes they are miracles of healing. We always like those and pray for them. Uh, sometimes miracles are simply a matter of timing or a matter of circumstances that seem to come together in a remarkable and miraculous way. One such thing happened one time for a young man that worked in a grocery store, and he was often involved in, uh, in carrying out groceries for people, helping them get them in their car and so on. So he was returning to the store from uh, one, such, uh, one such effort when uh, he saw a woman that uh, had her hands more than full and she was trying to find her keys uh, in her purse and in the process she had set one package up on top of the car and uh, so he offered to help her and assisted her and she got in her car and started it and started to drive away just at the time the young man realized that package was still on top of the car and as he ran toward her toward the car uh, that package slid off and he caught it that package happened to have been a baby wrapped up in it and it would have been tragic had that miracle of timing not happened I think in case of uh, most miracles, uh, there's some kind of a partnership between God and man. And that's, that's the nature of the story from Mark, the second chapter. And you'll also find it recorded in Matthew and, uh, uh, and in Luke. But we're going to focus on this uh, particular version of it. They are all extremely similar. Um, this partnership between uh, God and man often involves some kind of a crucial choice between uh, us who claim to be his followers, his children, uh, between us and uh, whatever, uh, whatever that uh, need might have, might have been that was, uh, that was certainly needing some kind of attention. Sometimes there's a crucial choice on our part as to whether we want to be a, a spectator or a participant. And obviously those are two very different kinds of uh, of attitudes and situations and um, reminds me of a story I heard one time uh, told by an Irish comedian he said he had uh, he had always loved uh, to hear um, Pavarotti's music and so he went to a concert of Pavarotti one time and he came back and his story was uh, uh, Pavarotti is, uh, is great, and, uh, and he really loved to hear his music, but Pavarotti didn't like it when you joined in and started singing with him. Well, sometimes it's okay to be a spectator. In the story that we have before us, this paralytic, a man who had uh, lived on a pallet for uh, perhaps many years. Uh, I'm sure that he had had from time to time some 
different attitudes and feelings about what was happening. There may have been times that he was hopeful. There may have been times that he was absolutely disappointed, maybe even angry, maybe in pain, maybe depressed. But this man, if he had known about Jesus, and even if he had known that Jesus was in town, he couldn't have done anything about it without help. The four men who got together to carry him uh, to the presence of Jesus, uh, those, those four men are unknown. We don't have any names. And uh, we can speculate, of course, about them. And uh, I'm pretty good at speculation and uh, sometimes uh, uh, putting a bit of an imagination into it. I have to believe that at least some of these four men knew something about Jesus. They were not, I believe, total Uh, totally ignorant of who Jesus was or what he was doing and that he was in town, in fact. Who were they? We do not know. There is no way to be specific about who they were, but I think they were probably in the general category of some of the people that we know about in the New Testament. How about the the cleansed leper that came back and thanked Jesus? And Jesus told him, said, now I I would like for you not to go around talking about this. And what did he do? He went around and talked freely about what Jesus had done for him. Could have been somebody like that. It could have been somebody like blind Bartimaeus. You remember that Jesus healed him of his blindness. And we're told in Mark that he followed Jesus. So here's another kind of person. Maybe it was somebody like Zacchaeus who now had been forgiven for his greed and was very uh, thankful, very gracious about uh, what, what God had done for him. The... Uh, that, he, that could have been a, a person like that. And then there was a lame man that Jesus healed at the pool one time, and he had been an invalid for 38 years. But Jesus healed him, and uh, this man was very grateful for what happened. It was not those four men, but I have to believe it was somebody like that that Jesus had touched along the way. How did they get together? Well, I suppose uh, whoever they were, they could have accidentally run into each other on the street corner, and so all four of them just suddenly decided that we'll go help this guy. I don't think that's how it happened. I think it was not an accident that they came together I suspect that one or more of those four took the initiative and made sure to be able to find the help that he needed in order to take this man to the presence of Jesus. Uh, Somebody had to know about Jesus and care, know where he was, and, and care about this man who was very much in need. How did they know about him? Well, it's possible that somebody of the four stumbled onto the fact that here was a paralytic. Uh, Again, I tend to sort of doubt that. I think that in that group, somebody made it their business to know who needed some help. And they were determined uh, to try and help provide what the man needed. These four men were totally determined and committed. 
to carry the paralytic to Jesus. Uh, if anybody in that group had said, well, look, it's hard to take a person who's on a cot like this uh, to another location and get him where Jesus is. This, this person is too far from Jesus to be helped. And I think I have heard that. Maybe I have felt that. I don't know. But these men did not believe that the paralytic was too far, too sick, too anything for Jesus to be able to help him. And so they carried him. They refused to let the crowd defeat their purpose. And as you know, uh, since the crowd was uh, close around Jesus, they took, uh, they took the paralytic up on the roof, the flat roof of the house, and uh, tore a hole in the roof and let the man down to Jesus and essentially laid him at the feet of Jesus. Um, I don't know if you've noticed or not, <clears throat> But the world is almost always in the way when you try to bring somebody to Jesus or bring Jesus and somebody together. But there was no obstacle that was too big. Um, and if those who might have said, well, he's too far away to get him to Jesus, it's going to take too much time, too much energy. It's going to take things that we don't have. Uh, it's just simply not possible to help this man. Oh, I, I do know and, and confess that I have felt that way about some people that I have met, that they are too far gone. They are too far from Jesus. They're too far from reality, they're too far from faith, they're too far from the things that count to be able to get them to Jesus. These four men didn't feel that way. There's something else that was happening at that point in time, and, uh, and a tragic thing it was, and to whatever extent it still happens, it's still tragic. There was a tragic social misunderstanding in the world, in among uh, whoever you might meet. That was the, the connection that they felt or understood to be between sin and suffering. Because they, they believed uh, as strongly as they believed anything that the person who was sick or injured or whatever the circumstance might be, uh, that, it was, that it had happened because of their sin. And they, they were absolutely committed that this man had to do something to make his condition what it was. Well, that rigid connection between sin and suffering got in the way many, many times. And the rabbis had a saying that there is no sick man healed of his sickness until all his sins have been forgiven. In a more modern phrasing, William Barclay said this belief was that a sick man was a man with whom God was angry. Jesus knew very, very well what this misunderstanding was. This man, no doubt, had been told for many years that he must be a sinner or this wouldn't be happening to him. <coughs> Even uh, 
even if he knew that those people were wrong who thought he was such a, such a horrible sinner, even if he knew they were wrong, I think he had, had very often been demoralized and defeated by those horrible attitudes that he had to be confronted with every day. Jesus knew that this man had two needs in his life. And Jesus administered a double miracle. Jesus spoke to his, his greatest need first, which was his spiritual condition. And I, I have to believe that even if this man said, I don't deserve to have the kind of paralysis that I do, I didn't do anything to bring it on myself, yet I think that he had to somehow buy into what everybody else thought about him and ended up with a very, uh, very difficult kind of attitude about himself and about himself being a sinner. But Jesus said, son, first thing out of the box, son, your sins are forgiven. And while I, I have reason to believe that the man might have liked hearing that from Jesus, yet sort of uh, uh, affirming what he already felt, the man still wanted to be able to walk. If he was going to ask for a miracle, it probably would be the miracle of being able to walk. But he must have felt some relief when he heard Jesus say that. But the people who heard it most clearly were the scribes and Pharisees. And they said, uh-oh, this man is acting like he's God. He's acting like he has authority to forgive sins and Nobody has that kind of authority but God, God alone. <coughs> and, of course, Jesus was aware of what they were thinking and very much aware of it. And um, he was going to address it. Um, Jesus had tried to tell and to teach that he was indeed the Messiah, and that he was from God, that he came at, at the behest of God the Father, and he came with powers, and one of those powers was to forgive sin, and another was to heal. Well, um, Jesus picked up, of course, very quickly what... Uh, <clears throat> what he knew they were thinking and feeling. And so he, he said to them, well, uh, answer this, uh, which is easier, uh, to forgive sins or to take, tell somebody to walk? Which is easier? It takes the same divine power to do either one, it takes the same power to do both. So, what Jesus did was to take their warped beliefs and beat them half to death with their own beliefs. And if there's anything that's difficult to accept, it's somebody taking our own beliefs and turning them around on us and beating us half to death. That's what Jesus did by saying to this man, okay, get up, take up your cot, and walk out of here. Because that was proof that Jesus could not only heal the man, but he could forgive his sins. And while the people were amazed... Um, they were also terribly bewildered because their beliefs had been torpedoed in a way that only Jesus Christ could do. 
and it turned out to be a many-sided miracle, a many-sided victory, a victory for the paralytic. He could walk now, he could work, he could take care of his family. It was a victory for faith. <coughs> because in that story, it says that when Jesus saw their faith, he talked then to the paralytic. He's talking about the faith of whom? Well, certainly not the crowd because they were against him, but it was an affirmation of the faith of the paralytic and of the four who carried him to Jesus. It was a victory for shared ministry. It was a victory for truth. It was a victory for Jesus affirming his divine nature and ministry. And today, perhaps there are many of us, many of you, who find themselves uh, in the midst of a troubled world and a difficult time, find yourself with broken spirits, find yourself uh, feeling very helpless, maybe sometimes being angry, sometimes being hopeful. Bring all of those broken items and hopeful items to Christ today and claim victory because there is victory in Jesus. If your faith gets a little shaky in these times, bring it to Jesus and he'll give you a victory. I invite you to hear and sing along with us the song uh, victory in Jesus. It has a tremendous message which you may identify with today, but I invite you to realize that we can be partners in a miracle.
We're pleased that you joined us today for this service. Now join with me in a closing prayer. Heavenly Father, you are a great God, a God of miracles, and so often you wish to partner with us, but especially you wish to touch our lives with your healing, with your victories, and so we pray that you will accept our thanks for every way that you do bring victory to our lives. We thank you and praise your name in Jesus' name. Amen.